All right, my friends, time for another AMA. It has now been five years since I quit plastic surgery residency. I figured it's a good time to give you some updates, answer your questions. We sourced all of your questions from Instagram on both at Kevin Jabal MD and at Medical Insiders. Follow us if you haven't already, as well as on the community tab on our YouTube channels. And again, follow us there if you haven't already. The first question is from me, because I know someone's gonna ask, Kevin, why are you wearing two rings and two watches? It's because I'm weird. And I am doing a comparison video between two fitness tracker rings. And you'll see that on the channel shortly. In fact, it might already be live. Check the description. And two watches, fitness, fashion. And I'll tell you the significance of this watch shortly because I got this right when I would have completed plastic surgery residency, which obviously I did not. But first, your questions. We'll start with some of the community posts. So on the Kevin Jabal community tab, a few questions here from ZBK3741. If we make a comparison in terms of income, is there much difference between your career paths? If I stuck with plastic surgery, in residency, you're making around 50 to 60K per year. Usually each year they add around $2,000. So a PGY6, meaning a postgraduate year six, so your sixth year of residency, you will be making more than your first year. So making 50 to 60K per year, um, compared to that with my businesses and my various sources of income, yeah, I'm doing a lot better than that. Now moving from there, there's a lot of variation with regards to a fully trained plastic surgeon. So I was looking at either hand or microsurgery, and those don't pay necessarily as well as an aesthetic cash-based a private practice. So the average plastic surgeon makes around $500,000 per year per Medscape's report. And they don't have exact numbers for aesthetic versus um, hand versus micro, but you can guess that hand and micro is making less than that. And uh, the aesthetic would probably be making more than that on average. So I guess we'll see in the years to come. Next up, Brijesh3510. Have you been treated different by people back where you, when you were in plastic surgery residency versus now as an entrepreneur? Not really. I would say that in residency, I think there were some people that I met that would be impressed by my profession. Oh, wow, you're like operating on people. You're cutting them up and like doing this and that. But then now there's also some people who are like, oh, wow, you're a YouTuber. You know, your channel size is that. Oh, wow. Like other than that, I haven't really seen a difference. Jake94. Hey, knowing what you know now, what would you tell past Kevin before he quit plastics? I like this question a lot. And the first thing that comes up is your goalposts are gonna move. So I think that at a certain stage in life, we oftentimes look at certain goals we have, whether that's professional success, financial success, reaching some kind of milestones and thinking we're gonna be happier at that point. And then we can kind of chill, relax, whatever. And I was fortunate that with Med School Insiders and MEM, we reach certain milestones faster than expected. But rather than chilling and being like, hey, I'm happy now, this is great, the goalposts just move. You, you then reassess and you say, oh yeah, that goalpost was like fine then, but things are different now. We should actually reach higher. So the biggest thing is just to enjoy the moment because I had a phone call with Dr. Amit Pandey, who um, you guys have seen on the channel if you've been around for, for some time, and he's coming back on the channel in August, which I think you guys will really enjoy. And having a phone call with him, I was telling him how we set these metrics and blah, 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 and we didn't quite hit them. And, and you know, the growth, we're pretty aggressive with our growth metrics year to year. And he's like, dude, you ever just like pause and take a step back and appreciate? Because what you've built is, is impressive and you should be proud of that. And you've come so, such a long way. So rather than focusing on 30% growth year over year, maybe it's okay if one year it's a little bit lower than that. Not a big deal. SK Khan, JW8LT, you have left something which is a dream of many IMGs. How do you reflect upon it? Some people say that I should feel guilty or ashamed because I'm taking a spot from someone else who would want to complete the path, which is incorrect because that path is uh, quickly filled by someone else and there's a surplus of MDs. So I feel zero guilt, zero regret in that way. Um, and then it comes down to just doing what you feel is right for you. And I think that this is aligns with my values and we'll talk you know, more about that shortly. But also I think I'm making a bigger impact this way, a much bigger impact actually, versus if I had continued plastic surgery. Esselana Lael, is it a bad sign if I don't know what I want to specialize in yet? I'm a college sophomore. Absolutely not. You don't need to decide until med school and specifically your third year is when you definitely want to decide sometime during your third year. If you can decide before that, great. Get exposure in college and in early medical school. But college sophomore, it's better that you have an open mind. If you actually are too set on what you want to do, 
That might be concerning because you may not actually understand the specialty as deeply as you will later. And once you understand it deeper, you may change your mind. So having an open mind and just seeing what do you appreciate about different specialties? What do you like? What do you gravitate towards? What do you not like? That's the best way to approach it and be reflective and be inquisitive, be curious. Zero Itage says, how does an MD PhD program work? from how the application process works to its benefits. We're gonna be covering MD-PhD in detail on the Med School Insiders channel, so subscribe there if you haven't already. And in short, you do your, your so Med School is four years, right? Your preclinical and clinical years. Uh, first two are preclinical, last two are clinical. And then you work on your PhD between those. So you do MS1, MS2, and then you have four years of PhD work, and then you finish your MS3, MS4 at the end. So it's an eight year program rather than four years, and rather than, paying you know tremendous amounts of in loans you actually get a stipend it's a pretty small stipend maybe you know thirty thousand dollars per year something like that maybe it's gone up now because that's back when i was in school king of carrots i just wanted to say you guys really got me a while ago with that april fool's prank every year we do an april fool's video on i try to do it on all three brands med school insiders chemistry ball md and jabal and cars sometimes we miss one or the other and we have a lot of fun with it so if you want to see some of those prior pranks I think the last year's one was pretty fire, not gonna lie. And glad you guys enjoyed. Pretty Face JC, how did you get into med school? Step-by-step -step process, including extracurriculars and interviews. If you look at the earliest videos on Med School Insiders, I actually talk about my personal journey, um, the extracurriculars I did, my journey to med school, my MCAT study techniques, all that stuff. So you can find that there. David LP, how to survive intern year with just a few hours of sleep. We talk about sleep deprivation on this channel. What it's gonna come down to is being as efficient and effective as possible to really be ruthless with your time to get as many hours back as you can so that you can try to sleep more. And then, you know, improving your sleep quality because you're probably not gonna be able to sleep eight hours a night every night, but if you can maximize the quality, then you can get away with slightly lower quantity. NE Chem, is high school physics okay for the MCAT? Do I really have to take it in uni? If so, is one semester enough? Yes, you need to take college MCAT level and one year is generally what is required. Next up, Jabal and Car's Instagram. How did you become a YouTube car reviewer from Aiko128JPEG? Essentially, I realized that with passions if you don't make the time you'll never find the time and it was years and years where i wanted to create a youtube channel in fact i recorded my first videos never edited them but recorded them in 2016 when i started med school insiders essentially in 20 last year it was the beginning of 2022 i said hey if i want to make this happen i just got to make it happen so i created pov car reviews because pov is point of view a gopro strapped to the forehead it takes a lot less time to edit and reduces the friction and i wanted to focus on just driving and you know, I'm not trying to create the highest production quality videos, but they're very driving focused, you know, which aligns with my uh, interests. I, I go to the racetrack a lot. I'm actually an instructor on the racetrack with a few different organizations. So if you're at the racetrack and you need a coach, maybe I'll be around, but you can follow me on Jabal on Cars on Instagram, on YouTube. And we focus on um, the driving dynamics of a vehicle as well as how to improve your driver's skill. Shervin shares the biggest mistake you made in your YouTube career that you wish you could do different. Shervin shares has an awesome channel. I connected with him a few months ago. Really solid guy, makes amazing videos. I guess the biggest mistake was not choosing a niche for this channel because it, especially if you go to the older videos, I'm all over the place. I haven't really, I didn't really figure out what I wanted to do. And even in the last year or two, we're kind of, we're talking about study strategies and we're talking about medicine. We're talking about MCAT, we're talking about productivity. We're talking about health hacking and, you know, gadgets. So in terms of YouTube optimization, that is going to hurt the channel. We're gonna get fewer views, slower subscriber growth, but Med School Insider is already a very focused channel and I want this channel to be a creative endeavor. So it's like a price that I'm willing to pay, but you have to acknowledge what the price is, which is that the channel will grow slower unless you really narrow down your focus. Shervin Shares does a great job of doing um, like tech and uh, you know, wearables reviews on his channel and I, and I find them quite enjoyable. He's super funny. Ted York, why are you so slow on the go-kart track? Ted is being a troll because I whooped his ass and my other friends really hard on the go-kart track. In fact, I'm undefeated on the go-kart track. You can even watch me race Fenton Sun in this video here. So Ted, if you want a chance to defend your honor, let's do a rematch anytime you want. Killian Bucci, how to make extra cash as a med student. We should actually do a dedicated video on this. But I'd say first, you can be an influencer, create a YouTube channel, an Instagram, TikTok, 
and monetize that. And there's many ways to monetize. I actually have a whole video on how to monetize your social media following, which is coming out in September. The second thing you can do is advising and tutoring. And Med School Insiders, we're always looking for more advisors and tutors because we keep growing. And uh, you're essentially helping out people at a lower stage in the training process than you. So if you crushed your MCAT, you can be an MCAT tutor. Or if you got into a med school and you have admissions committee experience, then you can help other students get into medical school, as an example. Satvik K23, about to start a BSMD program at Penn State, SKMC, any advice? First of all, congrats, man. Don't be too, like, have fun. College is an amazing time. Have fun, but don't get too wild, especially at the beginning. You don't wanna get derailed because once you, if you start off on a bad foot, it's a lot harder to fix that rather than just staying the course. So make sure your priorities are building those good study strategies, not procrastinating, not getting bad grades, all that stuff. You do need to maintain a certain level of GPA uh, to remain in the BSMD programs, but ease into the fun of college. Don't binge drink most nights and have multiple blackouts like I did. And uh, I'll be talking about my college regrets in a video in August. Main Doe Cage. What would you recommend, becoming an anesthesiologist or dermatologist? Both are great fields. There's pros and cons to each. We have a why I didn't series on this channel that covers, I think we've done both. And we also have a so you want to be series on Med School Insiders, which is much more objective. So if you want like an objective overview of the specialty, we work with a couple experts in the field. So we actually work with anesthesiologists to create the so you want to be an anesthesiologist video. And same with dermatologists for the so you want to be dermatology video. And that's very objective. And then my personal take is the why I didn't. George Angel MD, does the prestige of the med school you go to matter for your future career? A lot of pre-med advisors are gonna give you bad advice. A lot of SDN and Reddit is gonna also give you bad advice and say, hey, it doesn't matter. No matter where you go, you're getting an MD and a DO. And the curricula are all the same. And they're wrong. They have no idea what they're talking about. So the reason it matters is two things. Number one, you want optionality. You may think you want to do primary care or like me, gastroenterology. I was so set on gastroenterology. I have IBD, I have this history, and then obviously I changed my mind. So you want optionality because even if you think you're, you're going to do primary care, you may want to do neurosurgery. If you go to a medical school that does not have a neurosurgery program, you are at a massive disadvantage to actually end up in a neurosurgery residency. The other reason is that some schools care about your pedigree. And this is kind of um, a little bit pompous, if you will, where they want people who went to prestigious colleges and prestigious medical schools to then join them at their prestigious residency program. Siddharth Baiju, how tall are you? Six foot one, kind of weird. I had this one guy comment on a video arguing that he met me in person. I don't know who this guy was, that I'm like five foot 10 or five foot 11. Um, which is funny because I went on a date with a girl who also didn't believe that I was six foot one. She's like, you totally lied on your app that you're six foot one. And then we went to my house and we bet on it. And I was like, I'll bet you that I'm six foot one. And we got the tape out, went to my wall, measured it. I'm six foot one. And I won that bet. Vanessa R, the five-year plan, is it important to have one? There's usually two camps. Some people say, you got a plan ahead, otherwise you're not gonna know where you're going. And other people say, it's useless because you're gonna change things. I think the truth, like most things, is somewhere in the middle. Because with a five-year plan, you may change things. My five-year plan when I was in med school or beginning of residency was cool, I'm gonna be a plastic surgeon. And then obviously that changed. However, it keeps you on a track, which is moving you towards a certain outcome that you want. So right now with my business, I have a certain five-year-ish plan, two-year-ish plan, 10-year-ish plan, where I want to move in a certain direction. I want to, part of the reason I started Med School Insiders and MEM and not not just uh, built a personal brand and, and focus on the personal brand, is that I want to be able to step away and have the business run itself and grow. And maybe I can focus more on car things or whatever else I want to. I can, having the optionality where I can work on Med School Insiders and on MEM as much as I want to, which right now is, yeah, I want to keep working on them. But maybe in five years, I want to spend 20 hours a week on them or maybe 10 hours a week, right? So having a plan is helpful, but don't hold it too rigidly and be open to things changing. Tara Misu, I like that username. Other health paths that involve having medical knowledge, but not a healthcare provider. We actually have a, a whole video on this channel about alternate career paths, and there's gonna be pros and cons with everything. One thing that I was very interested in is medical devices. I think that is super fascinating. And having medical knowledge is, is not entirely necessary depending on where in the industry you work um, within that industry, but having medical knowledge would definitely be very helpful. Mohammed Srace, how can I match plastics if my grade aren't the best? He's at a graded school and at a lower tier school. So the main thing there you wanna focus on two things. Number one, crush your away rotations, network, um, 
try to impress those that are at these programs that have plastic surgery residency programs. And number two is research. Research does two things. Number one, it helps you network, which helps with number one. And number two is that research is becoming more and more important to really set yourself apart from other candidates. And if you can become a machine and crank out publications, schools love that because they're like, well, this guy's a machine. He's gonna to come to our program and help us crank out research publications. That helps us get more grant money, yada, yada, yada. So it's a very, very strong asset. We actually have a brand new ultimate research course designed for pre-meds and med students. And when I say it's designed for pre-meds and med students, what I mean is that it's, it helps you do research in a way that maximally strengthens your application. We're not trying to get you to be a professional researcher with the course. We're trying to get you to really bolster your application and, and get a crap ton of publications. Each of us that created the course have, I think over 60, I have like 66, and then uh, Sean and Paul each have well over 50. I think they're also over 60 at this point. Um, so we'll show you the whole strategies from A to Z, because it is, it's intimidating, right? Research is not, there's a huge learning curve and it's not easy to approach. Ooh, this is a good question. Jay Eskuzuk. What lessons from the medical field have transferred to the business side? I would say work ethic because medical school and residency does really hone your work ethic and your time management. So that is probably the most obvious. And the other thing would be getting comfortable doing things you don't like. I think there's a lot of a lot of chatter on social media and elsewhere saying that hey, only you know, choose these professions that you love and you'll never have to work another day in your life. With any job, there will always be elements that you do not like. That's just human nature. I love cars, I love going to the racetrack. But when I go to the racetrack, I love driving. I don't love doing my oil changes. I don't love changing my brake pads, right? There's always gonna be things you don't like about anything. So with business, especially at the beginning, like there's a lot of legal stuff and business formation and bank account stuff. And it's not the most fun sexy, but because you're you're used to doing unpleasant things from, from medicine, it's not that bad. Now, there are several questions here. Do you wish you finished residency? Do you regret leaving plastics, etc.? I'm gonna start with the watch and bear with me, this will make sense. In med school, I think in 2014, probably 2014, I got into watches, but obviously being a broke med student, not having the funds, I didn't really buy any expensive watches. I had like a $40 watch and I had the Casio F91W. It's like a $10 watch. And I promised myself that when I finished plastic surgery residency, I would buy myself an Omega Speedmaster, the moon watch, the first watch worn on the moon. That would have been in June, end of June of 2023, which just passed. And I got connected with some friends that were really into watches. Now a lot of car enthusiasts, I have a lot of car enthusiast friends, and a lot of people who are into cars are also into watches. So I found myself getting sucked into watches again. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting. This is the same time that I promised myself I would buy myself a Speedmaster. Now the Speedmaster price initially was 2,000, 2,500, maybe $3,000 back then. And now the price has doubled, now it's like six grand. And I was like, well, I feel like I should still do this. And I had to really, you know, weigh the pros and cons and I was like, eh, $6,000 is a lot. But I ultimately decided to do it. And the reason is that it is symbolic to me that I chose an alternate path. I ended up betting on myself, taking a lot of risk and it worked out better than I expected. And this serves as a reminder to better myself, to not be afraid to take the jump, take the leap, if it makes sense, not to be reckless, but that things are often scarier and worse in our minds than in reality. So I definitely don't regret it because things worked out, but if things did not work out, maybe I would, right? Um, but when I quit, I already had the businesses started. I already was working at the beginning of what became MEM. MEM wasn't ready at the time, but in residency, I was talking to my co-founders or who ended up becoming my co-founders um, about MEM, right? And we had that planned. Med School Insiders already had over 200,000, maybe maybe closer to 300,000 subscribers by the time I quit. And I already knew how I was gonna monetize that business. So it was, it was lower risk than I think it may seem initially. Now, the other thing, going back to that question about what I wish I would tell myself closer to when I quit, has to do with marketing. I've been appreciating the importance of effective marketing recently. And maybe I rushed the announcement. Right? I think I might have been one of the first to announce publicly on YouTube that they're quitting residency or quitting medicine. And I think that a lot of people have followed since, but I think I was one of the earliest ones. And I didn't have to draw so much attention to that fact. I could have waited, right? So these are just things that I've been reflecting on because one, with Med School Insiders, we're also realizing that to get to the next order of growth, 
to go beyond seven figures and now to hit eight figures, we need to focus on marketing, right? We need to focus on, because our product is now really solid and our product ex exceeds a lot of the competitors, but the marketing doesn't quite reflect the level of our services, if that makes sense. So if you look at a couple examples, if you look at Peter Atia, he quit general surgery residency in his third year, right? And a lot of people think he completed general surgery residency, which he never did. He actually talks about it in a podcast with ZDog MD. He also did two years of research fellowship at NIH, but in terms of actual residency, it was, it was his third year of general surgery. So halfway through, right? Um, if you look at Casey Means, Dr. Casey Means, right? She did most of her ENT residency and we talked about it on this channel. I had a conversation with her. She's one of the co-founders of Levels, right? A company that I, I love using and she does great work, right? But neither one of those really draws attention. Neither one of them really draw attention to the fact that they didn't finish residency. And if you look at Ali Abdal as well, Ali Abdal, I think it was, someone was telling me it was over two years between when he stopped doing anything clinical to when he made his announcement video. That's, I mean, he's he's very skilled at a lot of things, so that's not the main reason that he he grew so fast, right? But it definitely contributed because a lot of people said, wow, I, I love following you because you're a doctor and you do this. You must be, you give productivity advice and you must be so productive because how can you be a doctor and still do your YouTube and do your courses and do yada, yada, yada. And I feel like by, um, by maybe rushing and, and highlighting this announcement for myself, maybe I left some growth on the table. 16, Lewis Y. Literally read AMA as against medical advice. Nice. DePaul, Mr. Sir Kevin, <laughs> sir, how can I be expert in research? Please, I have paper due. DePaul is uh, a friend who is trolling me and he is one of the co-creators of the Ultimate Research Course, which is super solid. And it is on a limited early access sale. So check it out right now, medschoolinsiders.com forward slash research course. Jeffrey from MIA. Do you think you would have more subscribers by now? For Med School Insiders, I did not think that we would ever pass 1 million. We passed a million, was it 2019, 2020? And uh, something like that. And after that, I never really cared about growth because like, cool, 1 million was the goal. And now anything after that is just bonus. For the personal channel, I knew it would grow slower than MSI. I didn't realize it would grow that much slower. It's like 10%, right? And we talked about this before. I think it's just that we're kind of sc scattered all over the place with regards to content, which doesn't help. Jabal and Cars, I thought we would have more subscribers because we're only at 5,000 and the channel is a year and a half old by now. Med School Insiders went from zero to 100K in five months, zero to 200K in 11 months. Insane growth, all organic, no paid ads, no like Instagram, like it was just raw organic, zero to 200K from YouTube. And Jabal and Cars is zero to 5K in a year and a half. Obviously different niche, much more competitive, different, you know, it's harder to stand out there. I'm playing to my unique advantages with Med School Insiders. My last two campos, do you like cats? I'm more of a dog person. I'm actually allergic to cats. Johnson, any win. How are you so handsome? Ooh, baby. I don't think my girlfriend would like that. Andrew W04, do you think it's still worth going into CT surgery or is interventional cards better? With the changes in medical technologies, Interventional cardiology is gaining more and more breath with their procedures and CT surgery there's there's been discussion for the last like decade or, or longer about them growing more and more obsolete. I don't know. I am more risk averse in that regard so I would probably lean towards interventional cards but I have a whole video on why I didn't on interventional cardiology or was it cardiothoracic surgery? Anyway, it's uh, right up here. Dina Gal Al, do you ever regret leaving medicine? How often do you even think about it? Uh, already addressed this question, but how often I think about it? Pretty infrequently, I do occasionally have moments of, of appreciation to be like, wow, I, I had this alternate career option and I chose this path and I'm really grateful for how things turned out. Um, I usually get that when I come back home because I moved to Vegas. I've been in this house for two and a half years, two and a half years, and I love it. Um, I love having the space and the freedom and uh, if I stuck with plastics, I, you know, I wouldn't be living here and um, my life would look very different. Stevo3314, favorite study spot at UC San Diego? I loved the MET, the Medical Education and Telemedicine Building, I think it was. It's essentially the, the UCSD Med School because they had these rooms which were built for maybe 10 to 15 people, like PBL, small group learning sessions. But after hours, they were, they were empty and they had a TV, so I'd plug in a, uh, like an HDMI cable to my laptop and use that as an external monitor, like a second monitor. And then me and maybe one or two other friends would study together. I have I have fond memories of that actually. Dina Gull, second question. What do you do when you are in a period in your life filled with uncertainty and you feel scared? Um, I think reaching out to others is something that I've done, you know, talking things through. 
but then journaling because when I journal my thoughts become much more clarified otherwise things are kind of jumbled in my head and they don't quite make sense so when I journal I get much more clarity and then I know my next steps of action and having that the next step and rather than saying hey I need to climb this whole mountain just saying I need to do this then that and slowly build up towards that mountain makes things so much more manageable and um, when things feel impossible I rely on that a lot. Neanderthal, what's it like being Antarctican in the desert? I used to get all these questions about my ethnicity, so I would just tell people I'm Antarctican. And they'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, I see it. I'm like, there are no indigenous people from Antarctica. Um, but I made a video with my mom over here, and in that video it becomes very clear what my ethnic background is. Jay Sangvi, are you doing a So You Want to Be an Interventional Radiologist? Yes, we're gonna be covering essentially every specialty on Med School Insiders So You Want to Be playlist. Make sure you subscribe there. Matt in K9, do you put the milk or cereal into the bowl first? Obviously the cereal, who puts the milk in first? Monsters. Sean Choi, advice for incoming med students interested in non-clinical entrepreneurship. I would say read some books. I like The Almanac of Naval Ravikant, fantastic book. Um, prior to that book coming out, I loved Naval Ravikant's episodes, his podcast episodes with Tim Ferriss. Those were fantastic. I'd say get involved early with various interest groups and just see what type of entrepreneurship vibes the best with you. And don't be afraid to volunteer your time. You don't have to get paid at the beginning. You're gonna get, there's a certain level of um, value exchange where you work for someone else who's further ahead. Maybe this person runs a, a family medicine practice, right? And you can learn a lot from them working under them kind of like as, as an apprentice, rather than trying to seek a monetary exchange, you're helping them out and they're spending time and effort teaching you. Leo Lee, Yan Yu Lee, can you feat with Dr. Mike? You know what's funny is uh, Dr. Mike and his, his uh, producer or assistant or whatever it was, manager, reached out to me when I was in residency. So at the time, I think he was really big on Instagram, but he hadn't started his YouTube channel yet. So I was, um, it must have been like in the fall of 2017, I think. Uh, we were right around 200K subs and he reached out. We had a phone call talking about doing a collaboration to help you know, boost his own YouTube channel. And then um, I forget what happened. Like we didn't proceed. I forget if I forgot to follow up or he did. But um, yeah, I think now based on our different, our different niches and how we do content, you know, I, I don't know how much room there is for uh, collaborations or anything. Plus now he's all big and famous and I'm still but a peasant. Madeline May, one, two, three. What are some of your red flags? I'm intense, intense AF, which can be a red flag or a green flag, depending on the circumstances. Kevalia 532 so if I have one lasagna and I have another, if I stack them on top, do you have two lasagnas or one tall one? Asking the important questions. Madeline May, one, two, three. Also, can you talk about how porn has affected the world in such a negative way? I was pretty anti-porn and I was all on the NoFap train during med school and I used it as like discipline and like energy. I need more testosterone and focus and sleep deprivation and I was hardcore. I was intense. Um, but now as I've gotten older and I've read more about this stuff, listened to more podcasts, one podcast that I'm binging a lot, ever since last year actually, maybe it's been over a year, is uh, Modern Wisdom with Chris Williamson. Fantastic podcast, talks a lot about things like porn and, and evolutionary psychology and climate change, just like a lot of various uh, topics that are fascinating. I'm not so sure. I think there are people who have issues with porn, right? In the same way that some people have issues with alcohol. I have, a, I have like 40 plus bottles of scotch in my house. And I don't think it's a problem at all. I think I like collecting scotch. I would rather buy a bottle than pay 30% of the bottle price for a single dram at the bar. But I don't touch alcohol more than twice a month. Usually it's like once a month. Um, and when I do drink, it's like one or two drinks. So if someone, it, it depends on your relationship to the vice, not just the vice itself. If I were to have a problem with alcohol, I would do everything to eliminate it. I would remove it from my home. But since I have it once, maybe twice a month, I don't see it as a problem. Same thing with pornography. So um, there was another question here about like, do I have a girlfriend or why I don't have a girlfriend? Yeah, Z Sam, why no girlfriend? I do have a girlfriend now. I have been uh, happily in a relationship for a few months and bringing it back to the porn conversation, not really needed. Next up, Russell J. Cook. To what extent is prestige top 10, top 20, et cetera, of a residency program relevant? It is the least relevant in all stages of training. So between college, medical school, and residency, your residency program prestige matters the least. College, we have a whole video on MSI about that. Med school, I think we also talked about it in a separate video. Plus we discussed that earlier in this video. Residency is the least relevant because there are so many different practice types after residency that do not care at all about where you actually train. They care about your skill, 
right? As an example, the reputation of a certain prestigious Bay Area program in plastic surgery is that you go there if you want the name, but you don't want to know how to operate because they have so many residents per class, they have not the greatest volume, so you don't actually operate that much as a plastic surgeon. Although I did like their biomedical innovation. Unless you want to go into academia and you need a lot of research, then yes, you know, having a prestigious residency program is going to help you get more research opportunities. And some of those academic programs may also care about your pedigree. Wafa 6123 your views on pursuing PhD in neuroscience post MD anesthesia. Are you single? Winky face, <laughs> open for long distance. Uh, sorry, not single, but um, I loved neuroscience. The thing you want to keep in mind too is will the degrees make sense together or will they not? Because you can pursue something just for fun and that's, that's totally fine. That's not a reason not to pursue it, but I don't want four years of a PhD in neuroscience not to help you with your future career if you're just gonna be a clinical anesthesiologist and then your PhD in neuroscience doesn't help you as much there. Think, think how each degree is gonna help you or if you're just doing it for fun, which is fine, but then four years is a big opportunity cost there. Brayden J67, how come you guys haven't addressed private school versus public school GPA when applying? Good idea, we'll add it to the list. Aziz Agzamov, what to do if you decided not to go into medicine after college? Probably computer science. I had a knack for that in college. I did AP computer science A and AB. Um, I made a lot of small little programs on the side outside of class. I loved it. I thought it was a lot of fun. And even today, if I could not do entrepreneurship or I couldn't do my current entrepreneurship, I would pick up coding because I think it's so fun, so fascinating. Amon Buller 5, who do you want to box? Not really interested in boxing anyone. Ash Sundar, where do you get your good looks from? If I could only be half as handsome as you, my friend. Natcat37, do you ever worry that people in your life think less of you for leaving your old career? What's that Dr. Seuss quote? Those who matter don't mind and those who mind don't matter. Not really. My closest friends, including my friends from med school that know me well, I think respect what I've done because it's a lot harder than, than doing residency. Like residency is very challenging and whether that's plastics or anesthesia or whatever specialty you choose, it's challenging but it's a very straightforward path. You put in the hours, you do the work, you're good. Building a business, especially from scratch, um, not having the, the safety net of rich parents, as an example. The friends that know me, they know my background, they know the story, and they, they're very proud of me because I think what I did is uh, much more challenging to do. Otherwise, more people would be doing it, right? So it's higher risk in certain ways. It's, you're still putting in insane hours, especially at the beginning. There's a lot more complexity, a lot more uncertainty. There's no guidebook, there's no straightforward path. So the only people that seem to mind are random YouTube commenters, but in real life, I've never felt the same type of sentiment. W. Eugene Wang, what's the toughest thing about being on an entrepreneurial path? Same thing, which is like the uncertainty. There's no playbook. So at any given time, you need to decide what are the next steps. There's no finish line. There's no, hey, I'm gonna graduate here. Then I go into this stage. And I think that's part of the challenge, but also part of the excitement. SFXRXZ, should I go for becoming a doctor, but in military, because no debt. There are definite advantages to going military medicine, but it is definitely not for everyone. It's definitely not for me, as an example. We have some upcoming videos on this channel about military medicine, which will be very helpful. And then also we did a So You Want to Be a Military Doctor on the MSI channel. Dina Gall, what is your response to unsolicited advice and opinions towards leaving medicine? Uh, I think it's interesting. I think that I try to gather each comment as a data point because then it helps guide our content, right? I find it also interesting to just understand human psychology a little bit more. And usually it tells you more about that person and their come from and their values more than anything because unless they really understand you very closely and deeply, their advice probably isn't gonna have as much insight. Heron NP, would you ever consider going back to residency? Is that an option? For certain specialties, sure, but definitely not for plastics. Plastics is too competitive. Why would they choose me when there's all these other super qualified candidates? And even for me, like I loved plastics. I wouldn't wanna do something else that I don't love. But even if I did, even if I could go back to plastics, why would I do that when I've already built multiple businesses that are doing well, I have complete control over my time, I'm happy with what I'm doing, there's not much upside. And I think a lot of people just think of like, oh, but like you would finish your path. It's like, well, you gotta question your assumptions. Why? Why would you want to finish the path? What are the upsides that you get there that you don't get currently? Richie Riley, could you make a video on MDJD such as roles or combination of roles? Absolutely, we'll add that to the list. Thank you for the idea. By Rav Rohan 04, best specialty, plastics. Alendra M, your strategy to have maximum attention and minimum brain fog. The food coma from carbs is hitting me much harder in the last six months than previously. So that's a big one. I actually stopped intermittent fasting as 
uh, a related reason because having fewer large meals definitely hits my productivity and I make I get so lethargic and just so sleepy versus having multiple smaller meals. And then also being very diligent with exercise. I've been cranking on the cardio. I've been doing like five to six hours a week of cardio plus five to six hours of strength training plus some time of mobility. I'm doing a lot of exercise and like maintaining my body, which feels good, but it does take a lot of time. Strength training or cardio endurance, both. So when I was in my 20s, it was all about strength, trying to build mass, but my genetics are just not as conducive to that despite working with three professional coaches and counting my macros and doing all the stuff. Cardio and endurance is also very important for health and longevity. And based on the literature in the space, I've been prioritizing that more now. So I prioritize both essentially. And I'm spending roughly the same amount of time per week doing cycling and weight training in the gym. Nuvi Reyes, what does self-discipline mean for you? It means controlling your impulses and your short-term desires to better align with your long-term goals. Brijesh Sivabalan, did getting into medicine help improve your social skills slash presence? If so, how? I think having to do public speaking, being forced to do that, and you have to do that in medical school and possibly in residency as well, that has helped a lot. Um, I had a huge fear of public speaking. I did some Toastmasters here and there that helped. Doing social media, doing YouTube, talking to a camera in these longer format videos, like TikTok and Instagram is obviously not gonna hone your, your speaking skills as well. That, those have both helped. Pierce Bagby, thoughts on prenuptial agreements for doctors dating within or outside of medicine? I love questions like these because so many of us adopt the opinions of others based on the people around us and don't question them. I wish more people did this, oh my God. In, uh, in middle school, the discussion about abortion was super hot. And we were talking about this in seventh grade science class. And my question, I was always like, well, I wanna understand both sides. Like, what's the argument for, what's the argument against? And the argument against seemed kind of weaker to me because it was about Christianity and the Bible. I was like, well, isn't there supposed to be a separation of church and state? So why, like, why do you have another reason? Like, why are we entertaining that as the reason? And I made my decision based on questioning and trying to understand. And it's so dangerous. I, I don't know why certain people I think are less susceptible to forming an identity in that kind of way, politically. Like I've never been super left or super right. I've always discussed each issue by itself and made a decision there. Prenup agreements, same thing. It's like when I grew up based on family and friends and whatever, oh, prenups are bad. And then as I get older, okay, no, they make sense. As long as they are fair, I think it's a, it's definitely a good thing to do. If things work out with you and your partner, then the prenup is essentially meaningless. But if they don't, then it's that insurance, right? It, um, as long as they're fair, I think it's a very good idea. Same thing like with other issues, whether it's guns or whether it's, um, I guess abortion is now back in, in the media. Um, a lot of these things, if there is no issue that you've ever changed your opinion on, then you should really reflect, are you actually thinking for yourself or are you just following the hive mind of the people around you? It's so interesting how like the left hates the right and the right hates the left. And it's like, well, it's strange to me that someone can perfectly fit into one of those categories because maybe you're pro-choice, but then you're also pro-gun or you're more fiscally conservative or like, if you are actually thinking for yourself, you probably won't fall into these neat categories. In fact, when I meet someone in real life who's super one side or the other, it shows me that they don't actually think through things deeply and have their own well-thought opinions. And it makes me cautious of whatever conclusions they come to. Like, are they actually speaking from a place of logic and seeking to understand, or are they just choosing a side, laying their stake there, and then willing to die for it, even though they haven't actually considered both options? Ali Lahib, what were your childhood dreams and did you fulfill them? Race car driver, and no, I did not, but I'm doing the next best thing by hitting the racetrack and instructing on the racetrack as often as I can. My friends, thank you all so much for joining me. It's been a crazy journey these last five years and it would not have been possible without your support. So really, thank you so much. And this was a lot of fun. Thank you all for your questions. If you want to add some additional questions, make sure you follow me on Instagram at KevinJabalMD and subscribe to the channel. Much love my friends and I'll see you in the next one.